Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to presenting some ideas about quantum computing and kind of the state of the art, where we really are right now. And as uh, has been said, my name is Jacob Biamonte, and I'm a, I'm a professor at Skoltech, and we have a, a quantum computing group, and we work on various aspects of quantum computing algorithms and this type of work. So, <clears throat> so I have worked on the field of quantum computing for a number of years, actually beginning um, well over a decade ago, and I've solved several uh, notorious open problems, and I've introduced various different types of machine learning algorithms for quantum computers. And this is more recent work. Now, at Skoltech, we have a full stack quantum software development. So we have kind of an open source quantum simulator, a programming environment, this works in conjunction with the existing um, op uh, platforms from, let's say, IBM and, for example, Rigetti. It's implemented in Python, and so uh, this is available. Now, what is the point of quantum computing, right? So, first of all, quantum mechanics can't do everything on its own. So the way that these algorithms work is they work in tandem with a classical computing device. And so you will use the quantum computer as a subroutine. And this will be called repeatedly um, by a classical computer and there'll be some type of optimization routine. It will kind of circle and slowly mi either minimize a function or optimize something. The tasks that this is primarily good at are finding eigenvalues, in principle matrix diagonalization, but it, you will usually diagonalize a subpart of your matrix, not the entire thing. Um, and then different types of optimization. And so the first idea of a quantum computer is that of a quantum simulator. A quantum simulator reminds us of the orrery. The orrery was invented before Kepler's laws of motion, and these were used to accurately predict the motion of the planets. It's a simulation, and in modern times, we still have, let's say, a wind tunnel. Okay, numerical algorithms have not completely replaced that. So the first idea of a quantum computer is to build a physical system, and it will model itself. So you want to you know something, you build something, and you measure something. Now, these are kind of review papers, so if you're new to the topic, you can take a look at these. On uh, our website, deepquantum.ai, it has several of these. I think most of them are, uh, can be downloaded by PDF. And <coughs> the point of contemporary quantum computer science is to try to keep your problem as close to the physics as possible. The underlining physics of a quantum computer is very similar to several problems that actually arise in deep learning, they actually arise in protein folding, and the simulation of physics and chemistry. And so we try to bootstrap these, this underlining physics as much as possible, okay? And the current status, which I think all of us have heard about, are these different companies which are quite, you know, quite involved in this. Um, IBM now has 50 qubits. Okay, now the problem is we always, we always see these qubits in a picture. You never hear about what they actually did with them. And so I jokingly say, Google, stop taking selfies and give me one of your chips. I'll take pictures for you. And there's some truth to that. So what are they doing right now is they're trying to basically show that a quantum system can do things that a classical computer cannot simulate. This is an artificial task. It's known as quantum supremacy. And this is kind of ongoing work, and this should probably happen in the next three years based on some estimates. Um, after that, and concurrently, there is work now on different aspects of machine learning and deep learning. So most of the time, when we deal with, let's say, a restricted Boltzmann machine, we have to use some type of Gibbs sampling process, yes? So 
the Gibbs state, or the distribution itself, is a physical process that is created over time. So the idea is very simple. We try to replace those equations that we're simulating on the GPUs with a real physical process. And this physical process can be utilized then as a computational resource. So the idea is very simple. Now, the, and, you know, this is kind of the nuts and bolts of how this is going to work. And so the idea is, of course, again, the time scale of the physical process are short relative to the time scale to simulate those same processes. And <coughs> the types of applications right now are we're looking at various aspects of deep learning and a restricted Boltzmann machine model. Um, as all of quantum mechanics is typically done with a linear kernel, to create nonlinearity, again, you have to use a feedback loop and optimize something. Um, this standard training process. And so most of the interest on the Gibbs sampling is going to be done on the D-Wave type of quantum processor. Now, there's many different types of quantum computers. As I said before, there's quantum simulators, there's also quantum annealers, and there's gate model quantum computers. So the eventual goal is to make what's called a universal quantum computer that can do any quantum algorithm. In the meantime, we're using small pieces and devices that are noisy, and we're trying to work towards that. And the two main directions are to have a programmable system versus a system that is uh, able to control and has high precision. If you maximize both of those out, you get a universal quantum computer. <coughs> now, the difference between quantum computer science and classical computer science is based on the physical Church-Turing principle. So, in our classical world around us, the idea is that we can use a computer to simulate physical processes. But the conjecture is, which is not proven, that we cannot simulate all physical processes using a classical computer in efficient time. So in order to do that, we use a quantum computer to simulate a quantum process. And we believe, based on empirical evidence, that these two things are computationally inequivalent in the language of complexity theory. So we're not saying, for example, that quantum computers will accelerate and blast through all NP-hard problems in polynomial time. This is not what we're saying. What we're saying is that there is a subclass of problems that these devices will accelerate. And it is widely believed that certain classes of NP-hard problems will, uh, let me state this a little bit more precisely, it is widely believed that classes of NP-hard problems, a subclass of those might be more accessible through quantum mechanics, okay? But it's not going to solve every NP-hard problem in polynomial time based on all of our current uh, understanding. This is very important. So <clears throat> this diagram kind of shows a sequence to go from NP-hard, classical problems, adding some degrees of freedom, and you go to quantum hard problems. Now, I believe that this will be of extreme interest to the computer scientists in the audience. This is an old plot, and here's how it works. What we do is we generate satisfiability instances, okay? We pick a number of variables, and we start to generate clauses, okay? And we, and we look at this, and we plot the clause density, and we look at the percentage of satisfiable instances. On one side, you see that dashed line there? On one side, they're all satisfiable. On the other side, they're not. Then the question is, when I try to solve those instances, I go across that phase transition, what happens to the algorithmic resources? Well, based on all of our data, all of our current understanding, our best algorithms, they all blow up exponentially right at that phase transition. Now, it's quite fascinating. So, this is kind of nature saying, hey man, no, we're not gonna let you do that. And that's kind of a profound thing if you think about it. So every single time 
someone builds a physical system to solve NP hard problems, something scales exponentially, poorly. DNA computing, quantum computing, biological computing, natural computing, spin computing. They all have problems at that phase transition. Quantum computers are thought to widen the class of problems that we can address at that phase transition by just kind of providing a different solution to some of them. But that's just a dichotomy, okay? The dichotomy is we can solve these subclass of problems, but there's still these NP-hard problems left, okay? And this, if you want to read a little bit more about this, um, you can look up three SAT phase transitions. I recommend graduate students in computer science or in physics take a look at that. It's very, very interesting. So if you want to do some training um, with your neural networks, et cetera, you could try to decide which side of that phase transition is on. We're actually doing that in my lab right now. If someone is interested in that, please and come have a chat with me. <clears throat> so what we're doing now in Moscow, okay, so here I am. Uh, we're one of the only quantum computing software groups, okay, uh, in Russia. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to spread that information to anyone that's interested. Um, we're a completely inclusive group as much as possible. Uh, we have train a training program. Um, we have courses, et cetera. And we just got done teaching a course at Skoltech. Next year, we're starting a special track called a master's degree in quantum computer science. Okay? So if you're interested in just learning this or if you're from industry and you want to come down and talk to us, we're very accessible. Um, we have, a, we have the software stack, which we renamed Crystal with a Q, and it, takes py it uses Python, some kind of script, which is called Special Q, and we're looking to basically expand this effort. Okay, so there's now some national uh, interest across Russia. There's a national technology initiative on quantum software and quantum computing in general, and so we're trying to slowly build this team up um, step by step. So if you are interested, we're looking for people not just from computer science, but also from physics. So it's a very diverse team, uh, a mixture of mathematicians, physicists, and computer scientists. Um, please contact me, and I've actually kept this talk short because I think it's important to have some interaction with the audience and just to let you ask me questions, and probably I can answer them. And if I cannot answer them, I could maybe figure the answer out or point you to some sources of information that would be relevant. Importantly, is this. So join us, the first hackathon for quantum computers. What is it about? Free food. Okay, I shouldn't say that too loudly. Free food. We're going to have a couple of exercises. We're going to team up teams, one physicist, one computer scientist on each team minimum. It's a friendly environment, then we'll have a small competition at the end. And we're expecting people to come there that do not know anything about quantum computing or quantum physics. And we're expecting physicists to come there that don't know anything about machine learning. And it's going to be a fun day, okay? So after that, we'll do something called quantum beers, which is a lot of fun. And so right now, I wanted to just kind of open this up for some questions and just have a discussion with anyone that's interested. Maybe there'll be no questions, but I hope there'll be some. So does somebody need uh, clarification about quantum computing, uh, I know I need a lot, but let's start from you. Don't see any hands. Is this too complicated or too easy? Oh, I see one. Thank you for your presentation, Jacob. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so basically, you take a machine learning problem, you decompose it into basic uh, steps like uh, IG decomposition, uh, optimization, and then uh, you, what do you do? You construct a specific uh, physical solver for each problem, or you have, a, or, or is there a sort of a general purpose solver which you can actually prime to solve your problem for uh, any data set you have? Or you actually try to, uh, I don't know, hone it for a specific data set? So that's my question. Uh, okay, so that's a very good question. Um, there's actually several, several different approaches. The most important one is as follows. In a restricted Boltzmann machine, what you have is you have a collection of visible layers 
Then you have a feed-forward convolutional structure of hidden layers. These, this network corresponds to what's called an Ising model. That Ising model is the same model that governs the quantum computer itself. So the connections on the quantum computer are exactly an Ising model. And these things are tunable and adjustable. So the way that it will work is as follows. We have to train that network, use it, minimizing you know, the log likelihood, doing some kind of you know, back propagation, et cetera. But the difference is this. In order to train that network, you need to be able to sample it, yes? The sampling process relies on us, on a classical computer, mimicking a Gibbs state, a Gibbs distribution. That distribution is exactly the distribution that the quantum computer will do itself, if you just leave it alone. And you can accelerate that with quantum effects so it anneals into that state faster and it will work without quantum effects. And this type of computer is called a D-Wave Systems computer. And to answer your question, it is, it is programmable in principle and it's reconfigurable. So the types of problems that they're doing with this are generative um, machine learning, et cetera. Now, outside of that class of problems, you can also do various types of optimization, okay? And the idea is, again, that hopefully it will be reconfigurable. Now, saying that, why is this gentleman's question interesting? Well, just the other day, um, the CEO of Bleximo Corporation from Silicon Valley, um, actually a Russian gentleman, he's making special purposes dedicated hardware platforms to do drug discovery. Okay, those problems are valuable enough where you can put down a hundred thousand dollar, half a million dollar chip, and you can make one of these every time you want to study a different drug. So those are the special purpose kind of dedicated systems. These over here on the D-Wave side are programmable. So uh, thank you. Uh, so this question is m about machine learning, actually. Um, so if you train a classical machine learning problem, you encounter a prob uh, an effect of, what do you call it, uh, overlearning? Overfitting, yes. So is there any, any ways to incorporate methods of, of fighting overfitting in quantum setting, like regularization? or something similar? Okay, so that is not something that the quantum computer might or might not help with. I don't think so. So I think that what the quantum computer can do is it can accelerate the training process. But the human engineer, the human software engineer has to say, okay, how many variables are in my problem? How many degrees of freedom are in my network? Okay, so there should be less degrees of freedom in my network than variables in my problem, maybe, or maybe much, much more, so maybe a factor of 10. So depending on the problem, um, that part is just a classical description of the network. And so I don't think the quantum computer is necessarily going to help with that, but it will help with training, and then you're going to get these weights out, and you can test them, so it might help the design process to see if you are overfitting or not faster. Uh, hello, thank you for the talk. My question is about uh, the cost of uh, quantum computing uh, in machine learning. Suppose I am not a scientific laboratory, but I am a small company, and I want to deploy some of my machine learning algorithms on uh, quantum uh, computers. Uh, will I be able to afford it to myself? This is a very interesting question. So the D-Wave quantum computer cost 15 million US dollars. So what is that, about 2.5 billion rubles? So it's very expensive. Now, everybody's trying to talk about cloud access. Right now, the quantum computing companies typically give academics like myself free access by basically using their chips, validating their technology, and kind of going for it. At this point, quantum computers are almost commercially viable. Almost means all the signs are showing that these things are going to hit some problems pretty soon here, and they're going to sur surpass the best classical methods to do that. At this point, there are no companies saying, I need to use a quantum computer. So I believe that your question will only be answered in the near future. Um, right now, you can test this and you can play with it. If you 
send them some kind of document saying, okay, I want to run this set, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this, and I expect to learn the following. If you give them a good proposal, they'll typically say, okay, we'll give you some time for that. This is great, because they're trying to encourage companies to have this, their stuff ready. So essentially what you can do right now is just educate yourself on the topic, visit the hackathon that Jacob described, and uh, familiarize yourself better for the near future where you can actually access it as, as a, a AWS cloud, for example. Somehow, continuing previous question, um, I want to ask I, if it's so expensive to use um, cloud quantum computing. Um, there are uh, other kinds of uh, quantum simulators that are much less precise without any a open API, like quantum simulators on cold atoms, photon polyrotons, and so on, you probably know. And um, can you um, guess, could you use this much less developed and much less precise quantum simulators for your purposes? Okay, so this is an excellent question. The gentleman is asking, can you use current quantum computers which are noisy, they don't work super well? Ah, quantum simulators. So this is another question which is very interesting. So I'll answer your, okay, so now I understand it. Can you use the software to simulate the quantum computer for another task? Is that it, or the quantum simulators that exist today? Um, my question is that uh, there are a lot of existing quantum simulators now that are much worse than, for example, Z-Wave, like simulators on cold atoms and uh, photon polyrotons. Could you use them? Okay, so now I understand. I would say that the first generation of quantum technology to come out is obviously, obviously going to be based on superconducting circuits. This stuff is going to have a great day in the sun. It's going to kick the door open. Then the second generation of tech's gonna come. And that's where your cold atoms, your trapped ions maybe, um, your optical devices, those things are kind of like the next, like this, the second generation. So probably what, we're, what we have right now will be limited in some ways and then they'll kind of redevelop, redesign and kind of go after these more quantum mechanical uh, devices. So I think that currently those devices that you've mentioned are a bit behind the state-of-the-art for superconducting circuits. However, once the superconducting approach does re reach kind of a stable point, the limitations might be overcome by these disruptive approaches, which are fundamentally more quantum mechanical. Uh, my another question would be, uh, how do you think will be quantum physics a must for a machine learning in 10 or 20 years? Well, the cool thing about it is everybody that I talk to, they're like, hey, I studied quantum field theory and now I do deep learning, or I did string theory, now I do deep learning, or um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of physicists doing deep learning and the description, the mathematical description of quantum mechanics and quantum statistical mechanics is fairly similar to the kind of mathematics that you need for certain types of machine learning challenges. And so I think there's a fruitful interaction between physics and machine learning that already exists. Most of that interaction is with statistical physics and deep learning. And I think the interaction with quantum physics will be just as fruitful. And so I think in the future, um, at this development stage, we want to make these things as much of a black box as possible, okay? But the people that really want to get in there and you know they're working for Google, doing some research, et cetera, or IBM, they're going to go in there, they're going to understand these quantum algorithms and kind of tweak them. So I think a bit of both, but I think the interaction is fruitful. And we're seeing kind of both, you know, I'm learning things all the time from deep learning people and vice versa. So it's quite good. Thank you very much for the, for the presentation. My question is, what is the, could you provide some just ballpark estimates of, this, of the sizes of the data sets of the of problems that is possible to solve on quantum computer on the current technology. I don't know, 50 qubits, 72 qubits, what is possible to solve right now? Excellent question. So my personal predictions 
are that we can probably reach what's called quantum supremacy with the Google-style devices in maybe a few years. And with the D-Wave-style devices, I believe once they have 20,000 spins, that will become, uh, that will open up the door to do, doing a few things with image reconstruction that are with the state of the art. Right now, they have 2,000 spins for sale, which is 15 million US dollars. They have 4,000 spins in testing phase, and they plan to have 20,000 in you know, three years, like it kind of doubles every year approximately. And so I believe that um, 20,000 variables for the annealers are gonna be very, very hard to kind of pass classically. So right now, one of the bottlenecks of the devices is very interesting. It's hooked up to a fiber optic cable. So you have to send it stuff. If you subtract that off, the time scales are fantastic. And so the estimate is with 20,000 variables, even with that lag, will sort of break that barrier. And then I guess the next step will be, you know, putting a GPU on a superconducting circuit and kind of ho hooking those things together. So this is a, you know, kind of an emerging tech area. Back onto the 50 qubit side with um, Google, I think once they get up to about 100, 200 qubits, we'll be able to start doing some stuff that does become interesting even without complete error correction, just error suppression. So very good question. Uh, I think uh, a comment would be, as I, as I understood your question, um, the proper answer is not, uh, we cannot answer that until we know the architecture, a complete architecture of the solver or a system that's gonna solve this problem. Quantum solver is gonna be a, one part of it, but uh, other parts of pipeline. But I guess uh, when it reaches the sufficient complexity, uh, those kind of usual scales of uh, gig hundreds of gigabytes of data sets probably wouldn't be a problem. It's just uh, you need to find a way to iterate over it somehow. Does anybody else have any questions? Because I, I think Jacob's going to be around here for some time, and you can ask him later on if you want. Um, yeah, then I, I think we can conclude this section, which was a little bit shorter than I expected, but I guess uh, it's better not to stretch it out. Yeah, And um, I hope you enjoyed the window, like this look into the future and uh, current stuff. And uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.